take one still as well, if you don't mind, all the same sign. Okay. Okay. In the most fashionable synagogue, in the best district, members of Winnipeg's Jewish community gather for a testimonial dinner. Oh, the Westminster, that's right. Almost like the, almost like the Belle Pauvels, this kind of like from Quebec. Head table guests include Mr. Saul Keeney, the Chief Justice of Manitoba, Mr. Friedman, and of course, the guest of honor, Montague Israel's QC. At a hundred bucks a plate, it's a big event. Everyone's going to be there. You'll have to wait for just, I mean, you can relax for a couple of minutes. Uh, okay, I'll take them now. Dr. Matthewson and Mrs. Matthewson, Oscar Entel, Mrs. Entel, and uh, Dr. Wall. A distinguished occasion for the Jewish people of Winnipeg. Well, it wasn't always so distinguished. In the old immigration hall down by the CPR station, Joseph, it wasn't so distinguished. Russia, 1881. The assassination of the Tsar results in persecution of the Jews. They were a convenient scapegoat. They fled for their lives. They came from Russia, the Ukraine, Poland, mostly artisans, tailors, small shopkeepers. In 1882, the first wave of Jewish immigrants arrived in Winnipeg. Winnipeg, the end of the line, the middle of nowhere. Those first 200 Jews came with nothing, and Winnipeg had nothing for the Jews. No welcome, no work, no money, little food. But not for long, the men were offered positions on the new Canadian Pacific Railway. That's right. Building it. And there were land grants for those who wanted to try homesteading. And 28 Jewish families started a farm settlement near Musaman. And for that first group, it was too much. The vicious winters, the summer droughts, the crop failures. They quit the land and went back to a burgeoning Winnipeg. And for a time there were so many Jewish peddlers that there were anxious questions in Parliament. Soon they were opening shops, selling old clothes, junk, then maybe a nice little corner grocery. The 1890s were boom years in the West. The Jews shared in the new wealth. Jewish families became confident, if separate, members of the rising bourgeoisie. There was time for social niceties, new pleasures to enjoy. <laughs> they began to forget the old grind and misery. In 1905, an abortive revolution in Russia and renewed persecution of the Jews. The new wave of Jewish immigrants were workers, 
from the towns and cities of crumbling Tsarist Russia. They settled north of the CPR tracks on Jarvis Street and Stella, Dufferin, Flora. And one thing they brought with them from Russia, Marxism. The traditions of radicalism, including Jewish radicalism, run uh, very deep and strong in the north end of Winnipeg. Alderman Joe Zukin, and, uh, the only elected communist holding public office in North America. Many of the immigrants who came over uh, came with very few, very little in the way of material goods, but they came with a rich tradition of struggle in the European countries. Many of them had participated in radical activities, the distribution of leaflets. Some of them had been jailed for their radical and revolutionary activity. And they brought over two main things. They brought over a passion for education and a passion for social justice. A passion which led to Jewish workers giving strong support to the Winnipeg general strike. The unions were very good organized that time in 1919. Philip Sinder, now 83, once jailed in Tsarist Russia, was a union organizer. Organization ...where all the unions were affiliated, you know. And they decided to call a general strike. But the workers' triumph was short-lived. And the city mayor came out. And he says that if you wouldn't go home, it will be a very, very bad end of this strike. The people still didn't go away. They figured that they wouldn't dare to start shooting in a crowd where small children, some of them one month old, some of them one week old, children are standing there. They wouldn't dare. The Mounties charged. A man was killed. And that was the end of the strike. That was the end. The strike is a memory. The battleground built over. That close-knit, working-class Jewish community of 50 years ago is a memory, too. What was so special about it? Ask the kids at the Hebrew school. What's so special about the Winnipeg Jews? Yeah, I know a lot of different people, like, uh, I don't know them, but I mean, uh, people have made it big, Jews and not Jews, when they, they still feel like they're part of Winnipeg. There's something about the city that sort of brings you back, you know? Is that unique, unique to, is is that Jews, unique to Jews, though? But maybe it can be the city. Uh, no, but he's making a film on Jews. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I, but I think Jews is even more than uh, most because um, I, because the, the Jewish identity generally, you know, is, is stronger. This ethnicity is stronger than I'd say than a, a Ukrainian has identity to his nation, to his tradition. Well, Ukrainians, <laughs> Ukrainians form a greater portion of the city, and they just identify with the city just as much as the Jews do. In fact, when people think of Winnipeg, they think of, they think of the Ukrainian aspect. Of no, I don't think so. I don't think you're right. I don't think the other ethnic groups in Winnipeg have as much of a, a feeling of tradition and a bond so towards. What you're saying, that Jews, their own you're saying that Jews are better than any other... No, no, no. In this city, they're more traditional. And they, no, and they believe that, that you, you know, there's always been an aura. There's always been something about the, the Jewish community of Winnipeg that's really, you know... They stand you know, out. Culture, I think, because we have one of the greatest Judaic... The Winnipeg Hebrew School is a North End landmark where the students get a high school education with an additional emphasis on Jewish culture. It's always been the idea of the Jew to prepare his child to be a Talmud Chacham, a scholar, or alternately, if it were a girl, to marry her to, to a Talmud Chacham. Constantly, this striving has been toward children who would be imbued with the idea of learning Torah, of learning the Bible, the oral law, for its own sake. Nowadays, of course, this has become transmuted somewhat. Nowadays, Jews are still very intent on studying, but the studying nowadays goes into different areas. Rabbi Himmelstein, a recent arrival in Winnipeg is principal of the Hebrew school, known by everyone as the Talmud Torah. Did you go to the Talmud Torah? Oh. <laughs> to the Talmud Torah? That's the only thing. No, uh, please, darling. Okay, I'll, I'll explain that. It's really an interesting... On a quick visit home to the folks in North Winnipeg, 
David Steinberg, American TV star. My mother is concerned that uh, when I go on television, I don't give any billing to the Talmud Torah, which is a school that uh, did everything they could to devastate any indication of personality that was building up in me. But my mother's friends are involved with the school, so I do have to admit that I, I went to the Talmud Torah. Is that all right, Mom? That's right, That's very... Never mind. Meanwhile, on Channel 9, Winnipeg's community television, Noah Whitman and the Jewish Hour. Tonight, there's local gossip and news in Yiddish, followed by Hebrew folk songs. Winnipeg has been known traditionally as Yerushalayim de Canada, the Jerusalem of Canada. It has been alleged, although I haven't seen the statistics, that 7,000 Jews out of the 18,000 in Winnipeg have Yiddish as their home tongue. Shapsi Ackermann, schon Jürgen Hasen in Detroit, wird zu dem letzten Postsek von Bemezoi Menucha. And I grew up in a household in which Yiddish was spoken freely, Russian was spoken when they didn't want me to understand everything. There are similarities that we all experience. Uh, the carpet and the sofa uh, was never uncovered. Uh, there were papers on the floor. Just to cover the cover. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there were papers on the floor, there was cellophane right. on the lamps, That's and right. everything was covered for that big moment. And wow. that big moment occurred uh, in little explosions, like on Rosh Hashanah and on Yom Kippur and on the major holidays. But it was, uh, it was m not so much for our own big moment as to show the Gentiles, or the secular world, that we too were adjusting and were living the kind of life in your Canada, and we could become a part of it. What does he mean, your Canada? Who's Canada? At Marcia Sudak's house in North Winnipeg, Marcia and friends speculate on where Jews stand in the community. No matter what we did, we would always be the foreigner. Now, it wasn't the Indian who looked on the Jews the foreigner. You know, it was the it was the Englishman who came out of England. And this, you know, this was God-given right that he was going to take over this country. And it's a colony. And it was a colony, the, colony of yeah, the British Empire. Well, I'm, I'm trying to be objective. Like, I'm not, I basically uh, feel as so though we belong in this country. We, I, I don't feel as though I'm a feel a I'm in a group right. set apart from right. the rest of the right. country. Right. I right. really right. can't say yes. that I want to be thrown in as right. an ethnic. I don't feel ethnic at all. But I really think that if we look at our social situation. <clears throat> And I speak for myself, and I think for some people here, most of our social relationships are with Jews. No, I, I don't accept that. I, I don't we accept that at all. That. We choose to associate with people with whom we feel comfortable. I, th I think that we're being unfair in this discussion. You can't live in a, in a nation of 22 million people with a quarter of a million or whatever we are and say that we're going to be complete and separate like Dr. Golden says, unique and non-conforming. That's a bunch of rubbish. The children won't accept it, nor will the majority of culture accept it, nor do we accept it. I think Winnipeg's community is a very unusual community, and I find my non-Jewish neighbors are very lonesome and don't have the social intercourse and relationships that we have, and uh, they, they really envy us in many ways. Why are they any different Jew. than anybody else? Well, and I don't why feel different. I just feel that I'm a Jew, and this is my heritage. Why are we, why are we? Part of the heritage is prejudice. Once there were quotas. So many Jews in medical school, so many Jews in law. But now, with the old wasp power in Manitoba broken, things are different. Jews in a bourgeois or in a petty bourgeois position have to do an important kind of acrobatics because all of Jewish history, or much of Jewish history, is a story of oppression. And out of that has grown a philosophical sense of of, of a need for social justice, a need to work for social justice, I think, you know... Sid Frankel, you know, YMHA counselor. Biblical notions. Um, on the other hand, many of these individuals are at the top of the class structure here, or near the top, or wish they were, and are thus helping to perpetuate a capitalist society that oppresses many, many groups, and obviously oppresses many, many groups.
Well, no oppression in Tuxedo, one of Winnipeg's most exclusive suburbs. Once so exclusive, Jews were excluded altogether. They got more friendly with the Gentile population, you know, those big money, money Jews, you know. So they let them go through one by one. And now there's a location there in the, north, in the south end where you find the Jewish people occupying the nicest places, the best places. Certainly. But the higher you go, the more that's expected of you. It has to do with two very Jewish things, Yiches and Kovid. Mira Spivak explains. Yiches, roughly <laughs> translated, means prestige or status, and Kovid means honor or recognition. I think that one of the ways in which, um, in which a, a Jewish man achieves Kovid is to labor for the causes of the Jewish community, those of Israel and those of Jewish education at home. And that's a very important thing to, uh, to Jewish people. I think it's the UJA, although, although I'm not sure of the exact organization, puts out a book each year stating how much an individual gave this year and how much he gave last year. And I, I'm sure that pressure is exerted, especially on businessmen, you know, in the community. Um, to give as much this year as last year or to give more this year. Everyone knows everyone else and how much they make. And, uh, much they and, everyone has, and everyone has some ideas of how much they can afford to give. And the refrain is always, give more. I mean, this is, this is the slogan. And so uh, uh, not only do the members of the Jewish community feel that they must look after their own and they feel that they, they can achieve uh, their sort of recognition by doing so, but they make sure that their neighbor does too. But the Winnipeg Jews have given society much more than just money. They have given themselves. In the arts, sciences, professions, and politics, a community of around 20,000 has produced names to rank with those whose statues ring the Manitoba legislature. Sigurdsson, Shevchenko, Kashe, Wolf and not a single Jew among them. Statues, who wants statues? They should put one up to the woman that first introduced potato latkes and sour cream, and the blooms with the sour cream. Those are the people that deserve statues, not the generals. At Oscars, they would agree with that. Oscars delicatessen on Main Street. And home of the smoked meat sandwich. Guns on Selkirk Avenue, the North End's best-known bagel factory. Eight different kinds of bagels. It's a family business now managed by Arthur Gunn since his father died. If you're a North Ender, these are the places you come back to. Arthur Gunn. He grew up right behind the store there. Counting bagels. When I come back here, where do I go in the north? Judy Lander, in town with the Jacques Brel show. It's called Kalekis, where if you've made it, that is, if you've gone as far as Fort William, Ontario, <laughs> then you immediately send your autograph photo to Kalekis's, which is a Greek hot dog place, which makes the best hot dogs in North America. And there are a bunch of wonderful sisters who run this place, have been making the same hot dog meat for 45 years. So you know you're going to go in there, you're going to get the same thing you got as a kid, right? A genuine Kalekis jumbo hot dog. Simon's is still there on Main Street, but Toff's is gone, that legendary place. Well, legendary if you're over 35. Toff was an Arab. You went to his place after the show for Cokes and hamburgers and arguments. Arguments, they were debates, let me tell you. And there's the College Theatre, where everybody went on Saturday night. Jehovah's Witnesses have got that now. At least I remember how to break. Well, uh, you then there was that hall of learning, the Nordic pool room. The the game. Don't Not that you saw too many Nordic people in there. Well, it's a funny thing when you think back over the years. 
Think back over the years of all the guys that went through here, some of the guys from Ontario. Well, I, Real big fight. I'd say some of the best pool players come out of the North. Yeah, they, they and sure doctors did. and lawyers, too. Sure guys did. with names like Merv the Curve, Dingy Dollar, Speedy Fogel, oh, yeah, another, uh, Crusher uh, Kornberg. Oh, you remember that Larry Thole fellow? He used to be here years back. Yeah. Then there was this West Indian. The the, uh, Too cool Jewel from the Parrot yeah, Jewel, they called him. The he wasn't a Jew at all. Yeah, but, uh, Bill Jewel was a kind of one-man Jewish defense league in the days of the North End gang fights. Hey, beautiful. You haven't forgot a thing. They call the synagogues shuls. David Steinberg's father used to teach in a shul in the North End. I don't quite remember what it was like to be in that shul. All I remember is a lot of noise. Now, you were not necessarily a, a synagogue goer, but you, but you would go because of my father, right? The thing that I remember most clearly, in this synagogue, everybody had complete freedom. There was no, no such thing as uh, quiet during prayers. Silence. Kids were running up and down the aisles, even on Yom Kippur. But the thing was that upstairs, the women sat upstairs. <laughs> And uh, David's dad would look up there, and, you know, he, he never mad, but he was trying to beg them to stop talking. You, see. you know, something was going on, you know, maybe they're opening the Torah, they're going to read from it, and he'd hammer and say, Vobber, women, you know, quiet for one. <laughs> but it was, I mean, this is all taking place in a synagogue, not at a football game. But you had you know, no and, idea of the noise. And he would, he would yeah. say, he would announce uh, in, during the Yom Kippur service, at about two o'clock in the afternoon, as when everyone would start to get restless, yeah, he would bang in the city and he says, I promise you'll be on time for the Blue Bomber football game. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. He had a specific philosophy, and his philosophy was that a shul is a place for life and not a place for death. And the children could come in screaming and they had to be quieted, but the praying, the davening went on all day long, and it was a very, very open atmosphere. And what, unfortunately, none, there's none like that anymore. There's a lot that's not like that anymore in the North End. The stores are going, it's true. But even if those neat little houses and familiar corners are still there, there's a sense of people growing up, growing old, going away, it's not the place so much as a way of life that's disappearing. The needle trade is part of that Jewish way of life. And little factories like this used to be a father and son tradition. But no more, says Sid Gitterman. It takes about, I would say, about 15, 20 years for anybody to become a decent furrier. And the kids haven't got the patience, and I don't think there's enough of us left to teach them. Myself, I'm not interested that much to teach anybody, because how much longer am I going to be at it? It's a question of another few years, and then it'll, I suppose, just disintegrate, and that's all. I'll close it up and retire. If you're a stranger to the North End, there isn't much to see. It was the people who made the North End what it was. And perhaps the memory of the old North End will just fade away, like those old Jews from another century. I come from Kiev, and I come here to 52 years this summer. The birth is Karoni, another name, I remember. So 52 years. And I got five children, three boys and two daughters. I got uh, 10 grandchildren. I got 14 grand grandchildren. I'm 95 years, the way you want. And I'm very happy where I am here. And the old people, the old staff, was very good to me would say it's very good care of me.
like a mother. I came to Winnipeg from my Jewish nation. And the Jewish nation in the Tsar was very depressed. No freedom at all. Economical, political, cultural, no freedom. But when I came to Canada, to Winnipeg, and I see everybody goes in the street, no discriminations. When I come in a cafe, no discriminations. And I see Canada is the place for me. It's a place of liberty. It's a place of tolerance, religious tolerance, political tolerance. Then I thought myself, here is the place what I will raise my family. And I did it. Small world, small world,